All right, class, uh, today we start chapter five as we move along. And today we're going to talk about the constraints of motor control, overview of neurological impairments. And we'll look at each individual case study and actually look at some videos. So before we start, this is an introduction to the difference between signs and symptoms of pathophysiology of motor control. Now, sounds very complicated. So again, this is not a physiology class, this is not a neurology class. So it's beyond the scope of my class to actually go into the pathophysiology, but you must have a, a baseline of some neuroanatomy, anatomy, and physiology to understand uh, what we're talking about. So treating a patient with motor control problem requires knowledge and skill. So you can't just have some Joe Schmo off the, the street and say, okay, I'll just try some exercises here and there. And hopefully the patient gets better. No way. You have to have a lot of training. You have to understand how uh, this patient got injured, what stage of rehab they're in, in order to be effective. So essential in treating patients with movement problems is the understanding the physiology and the pathophysiology of motor control. Pathology within multiple systems, you have sensory, perceptual, cognitive, can result in impairments that constrain functional movement. We're always talking about function. Now, this is very uh, important for you to understand, always on the quiz, and uh, hopefully you enjoyed the um, study guide that I gave you. But um, the signs are objective findings of pathology determined by a physical exam. So we can actually visually see it. So you could see swelling of the tongue. You can see nystagmus, which is rapid eye movement. You can see a rash. Uh, limited range of motion. You could actually measure that and see that. So that's a sign. You must have an objective finding. Basically things you can see and observe. Now symptoms are different. These are subjective reports associated with pathology perceived by the patient and not necessarily objectively documented. So you can't really document how do you measure fatigue? How do you measure dizziness? How do you measure when the patient says I'm hungry or I'm sleepy? Uh, right, so make sure you don't use signs and symptoms interchangeably because they mean completely different things. Use the correct terminology when it comes to using signs and symptoms. So sign versus symptoms, there's positive signs. Uh, so presence of abnormal reflexes such as the Babinski increased muscle tone. So that would be a positive sign and symptom. And a negative sign and symptom would be paresis loss of descending control of lower motor neurons or a loss of strength. So there's a difference between a positive and a negative and we can use both to our advantage uh, when we're doing rehab just knowing what's what. So a positive sign is that somebody has abnormal reflexes or increased muscle tone well we need to maybe we can use that increased muscle tone to our advantage when we're doing our rehab. Maybe we know about the Babinski the, uh, uh, the abnormal reflex and we know to either avoid it or we can produce it to get the desired effect. So make sure you know the si difference between signs and symptoms and what each one does. Now you have a primary versus secondary effects. Now this is uh, important. CNS lesions, such as the primary impairments affecting motor sensory perceptual and or cognitive behavioral systems. So you have paresis or spasticity. So you're either weak or you have a lot of spasticity. So we're gonna show we have some weakness in some patients, but we have spasticity in another one. So that's the primary effect. Now, because they have weakness and because they have spasticity, they can have secondary impairments that do not result from the central nervous system lesion directly, right? So because you have weakness, now that might lead to muscle contractures or because you have paresis that might lead to muscle weakness because you have spasticity that might lead to contractures or that might lead to range of motion does that make sense a primary versus a secondary so knowing the difference you have a primary reason that you have these problems but because of these primary problems you can have these secondary impairments as well and i'll show you these nice videos so you understand maybe you can tell me what primary and secondary is when we watch these videos so primary versus secondary you have a pathophysiology which is the lesion in descending motor systems okay so that's the reason that they have that 
Then you have a primary muscular neuromuscular impairment, which is either paresis or spasticity. So the either they have we, some kind of paresis or they're spastic. And then they have a secondary musculoskeletal issue, which is structural and functional changes in muscles and joints. So impairments of the muscle or action systems. The action system is the area of the nervous system, whether it's the motor cortex, the cerebellum, or the basal ganglia. They perform processing essential to the control of movement. So what is weakness? Weakness is defined as the inability to generate normal levels or force. That's the definition of weakness. So if we go into motor weakness and then the motor cortex deficits, that's the inability or difficulty in recruiting and or modulating skeletal motor units to generate torque or movement. Component of upper motor neuron syndrome, uh, example would be hemiplegia, hemiparesis, weakness affecting one side of the body. You have paraplegia, affects the lower extremities, or you have tetraplegia, which affects all four limbs. So if you have case studies Janice, Jean, Thomas, or Malachi, they have motor weakness or paresis. That would be an example of what category we could put Janice, Jean, Thomas, or Malachi into. Now you could have motor cortex deficits also with cerebral palsy, which would be Malachi and Thomas, children with CP are significantly weaker than their peers. Children with hemiplegia had weakness on both involved and non-involved limbs. Weakness was greater in their distal muscles versus proximal. Their hip flexors and plantar flexors were stronger than antagonists, which led them to tightness because they're overpowering their antagonists. When asking a child without CB to contract the quads, only the quads fired. But when you have a child with cerebral palsy and you ask them to contract, guess what? Their quads and their hamstrings both fire. So they can't disassociate the agonist from the antagonist. So that's why it's difficult treating cerebral palsy patients. Now muscle tone is different. That's characterized by muscles resistance to passive stretch. So you have abnormal muscle tone, which is a spasticity. You also have hypertonicity, which is manifested by spasticity or rigidity. Spasticity is motor disorder, velocity dependent, increase in tonic stretch reflexes with exaggerated tendon jerks. Component of motor upper motor neuron, so you have either it's flaccid, you have very low tone, you have normal tone, which is you and I, then you have spastic, then you have really rigid. You can't move that. Those are extreme muscle contractures. So what is spasticity? Let's take a look here. Now, when treating a patient with spasticity, spasticity limits a patient's ability to move quickly. So overactivation of the antagonist, inadequate recruitment of the agonist, and impaired coordination. So when you're doing the rehab, don't focus on just reducing the spasticity such as baclofen or drugs. Focus on all the aspects of motor control. You can use the physician to give you the baclofen, but when we're doing uh, uh, rehab, we don't want to just reduce the spasticity. We want to work on all the aspects of motor control. And as we get further along in treatment, we'll discuss what is effective and what is not. Remember, we got to see the big picture. That's the only way that we're going to help these patients. Now, what if they have loss of selective muscle activation? So they can only recruit certain muscles. They can't selectively activate a muscle, <clears throat> allowing just isolated joint movement. So this makes it difficult. When this is lost, more muscles are recruited and coupled with motion. So a patient can't just bend their elbow or they just can't straighten their elbow everything their whole shoulder girdle everything moves as a unit and that makes it difficult so they can't isolate the movement so that's such one real 
uh, uh, pattern. So here's a very simple pattern that you'll see. That's a flexion, flexion synergy. So what's going to happen is the scapular is going to retract. It's going to elevate. The shoulder is going to abduct, externally rotate. The elbow is going to flex. The forearm is going to supinate. And the wrist and the fingers are going to flex. They cannot isolate just one of those. Everything has to go together. That's called a flexion, flexion synergy pattern. Those are difficult to undo and to retrain. Okay, that's happening at the uh, 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 motor control level at in the brain. So we need to find ways that we can maybe use the flexion synergy, maybe isolate it, but understand that all these patterns are happening all together. So here's a impairment in the action system. This is a flexion synergy. So we can look at some of these videos that, like we did and see some of these uh, impairments that are taking place. Now, motor cortex uh, deficits, you have co-activation, which is simultaneous activation of distal muscles during functional movements. So present in neurologically intact individuals just learning a skill and individuals with neurological pathology suggest may result may not result of pathology but may represent a primary unrefined form of coordination so we need to work on this okay they they have co-activation simultaneous activation of muscles that maybe we don't need now we'll keep going into motor impairments associated with subcortical pathology so this is uh, john He's got cerebellar pathology. Okay, so cerebellar pathology, that's hypotonia associated with pendular reflexes. Uh, Down syndrome would be an example, cerebellum lesions. Ataxia or discoordination of voluntary movement, hallmark of pathology within the cerebellum. Okay, so I'll show you a video of John here. Action or intention tremor, rhythmic, involuntary, oscillatory movement of a body part. Now we have another cerebellar pathology. She has multiple sclerosis, which is SU. So if you have SU, we have delays on the onset of movement. We have errors in range of motion and direction, dysmetria, inability to sustain regular rhythmic movements, um, dysdiokinesia, you undershoot or overshoot a task, and you have intentional tremors, which happens during an activity. Um, healthy individuals, this is distinct start and finish, meaning you know when it starts, the task starts, and when you know finish. Uh, unfortunately, with uh, cerebellar pathology, we don't know when the movement is starting or ending. It's just all kind of blended together. Now, a basal ganglia pathology, that's a hypokinetic disorder. That's Parkinson's disease. And I'll show you some movement impairments that occur during Parkinson's disease. Characterized by minimized movement, you have slow movements, increased muscle tone, you have a resting tremor. And they can have hyperkinetic disorders, which such as Huntington's disease or athyloid, athetoid, I'm sorry, cerebral palsy, characterized by excessive movement. Now again, if you have Mike, the Parkinson's patient, um, he has slowed movement called bradykinesia, such as his handwriting, akinesia, which is the reduced ability to initiate movement, and you have rigidity, which is heightened resistance to passive movement of limb independent of velocity or stretch. We call this the lead pipe, which is a constant resistance, or you have the cogwheel, which is alternating episodes. More on basal ganglia pathology, you have resting tremor that occurs in a body part not voluntarily activated and supported against gravity, increases with stress. You have a kinetic tremor that occurs during voluntary movement. You have a hyperkinetic disorder, which is athenoid cerebral palsy, such as Malachi. Um, you have dystonia, syndrome dominated by sustained muscle contractions, twisting and repetitive movements and abnormal posture. 
once you have the initial one, then you have all these secondary musculoskeletal impairments. So the primary neuromuscular impairments result in secondary muscular impairments. So spasticity changes the physical properties of muscle, increased fiber size variability. So tight gastrocs are not always due to muscle fiber tightness. Paresis results in underlying structural changes to the muscle.